So everybody, I would like to um, welcome you to our third panel discussion uh, entitled Notions of Generating Connective Creative Infrastructure. Um, this panel discussion falls underneath a broader um, project that the Meta Foundation is currently running. The project's title is responding to the statement, the problem with African contemporary art is dot 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 question mark. The project aims to unpick where African contemporary art sits within the current global and continental um, context by intervening in this statement. The project is hoping to air out various different sides of this statement, so I guess both the positive and the negative. Um, but doing this in such a way that trying to reframe this idea of the problem as one being um, a problem that comes from a continental history of colonialism, consumerism, othering and extraction. The project really wants to reflect on our position and wants to kind of unpick the questions about why we've been as a continent been left out of serious debate and consideration regardless of our obvious um, talent. Really unpicking some of this idea about the excitement um, around what has been touted as this African moment with many private collectors and institutions rushing to join the fanfare. Um, the project is hoping that through this cross-pollination and debate um, that we will be able to kind of look at where we stand how we protect ourselves um, at this moment from being taken advantage of, how we find our own voice in this conversation, um, how we take a leadership role in, in who we are and where our work goes and what is done with it. Um, and how, I guess, we find our own seat at the table. If not that table, then how do we make our own table to have these debates at? And one of the ways that we're doing that is through a series of um, panel discussions. This is the third in the series. There will be one fourth one next week, which will reflect on um, the global digitization of um, art. Um, all of these are going to exist on the YouTube uh, channel of the Meta Foundation. So if you've missed out on any previously, please feel free to go back. And if you wanna rewatch this one, it should be um, up over the weekend. With that, I would like to um, hand over to, to Gemma Hart, who is going to moderate this panel. I would like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for giving their time and voice and expertise to this conversation. And I would like to thank the National Arts Council who has funded this project and help, helped us um, make this thing a reality. And uh, without further ado, over to you, Gemma. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the introduction and also for the opportunity to participate in this project. Um, and thank you to our panelists this evening. Um, I hope this, is, this will be a really interesting and fruitful conversation. Um, and then also thank you to everybody who's joining us from wherever you may be. Um, yeah, so our panelists this evening are Malema Moila, uh, Patrick Murakareza, Ompemese Rabakhaste, and Anthea Boyes. Um, and sort of, yeah, my, my access point or entry point rather um, into this, this conversation about um, contemporary African art was um, there is a moment for me late in, in, in April where I came across the M map um, of countries for and against um, the patenting of the vaccine. And so the usual suspects of the West uh, were all for the painting of their vaccine, so thus not making it kind of like globally accessible, even though it has been like globally funded um, and researched. And it was really just um, another stark reminder of the same sets of strategies that continue to be used, um, kind of having, having their origins in, in, in colonial extraction. Um, and I was really sort of disappointed um, to see that, you know, even in this moment of planetary crisis, when there's an opportunity for global solidarity, the West still seems to privilege self-interest and profit over human life. 
and you know this is nothing new um even though this is the conversations around vaccines has um has sort of moved on from that point and we're at you know in south africa at this moment of trying to establish you know like mass rollout um yeah it was kind of just really like an, an entry point um for me to think about these these modes of of extraction but then also to think very critically about you know what our what our options are in terms of of establishing connections with one another on the continent um and to really just try and like foster that and so i'm very interested in this idea of connective creative infrastructure um which to me is like is a relational matrix and you know not yet not merely the brick and mortar institutions but also the ideologies and between uh, the ideologies and people both within and inside of them um, including the passage of ideas between practitioners the mechanism through which knowledge is shared as you know potentially a tangible exchange a partnership um, a collective a collaboration between individual agents and organized groups so I'm really interested in how we can foster connections between cultural practitioners, specifically addressing um, their contextual needs through strategies of collective work and problem solving. So trying to find ways to establish agency um, outside or beyond institutions. Um, and really just kind of like grounding, you know, often, often these ideas of like collectivity or connection seem really like intangible or out of reach and i'm hoping to ground that through the experience of, of the panelists this evening so uh, by way of introduction um could each of you just briefly provide some context to the to the audience um on how you situate yourself within the larger creative ecology and then i'm also going to um, borrow a beautiful phrasing that i recently heard from jag's head curator Quizy Gule, and ask who are your companions and by this I mean your theoretical references, professional mentors, and sort of like important peers. So just to get a sense of like how you situate yourself. Um, yeah, so maybe um, Ole Mark, you could, could start with that. Sure, thanks Gemma, and, and thank you Sarah for in, inviting us all to have this conversation. Um, so my name is Mulemo Mwira, I am Johannesburg-based um, artist, organizer, writer, researcher, um, and come very much from a contemporary art background, um, practice as part of one half of the Arts Collaborative Made You Look with Nairi Mohoto. Um, and my <laughs> companions um, are increasingly, I think, um, kind of broad spectrum of people whose uh, minds and ideas are valuable and um, challenge me into kind of different spaces um, and um, increasingly outside I suppose of the contemporary art scene. Um, I am increasingly working with um, people from technology backgrounds or from farming backgrounds um, who really kind of um, inform my way of thinking in ways that um, are quite difficult, I suppose, to stretch within the sort of narrow frame of contemporary art practice. Um, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll leave it at that, keep it short. Thank you. Maybe, um, Patrick, if you can answer that question. Yeah, uh, my name is Patrick Mdekereza. Um, I'm the director of Foise Art Center in Lubumbashi, Congo, uh, since a week now in Switzerland. Uh, 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 jury. And um, so, uh, as Waza is main, my main, uh, so it's, a, it's an art center, so it's, it's take me a lot of time, but also it um, take a lot of those, the, the thinking and uh, the projects, almost all the projects I do now. Um, Yes, so the companions, hmm, it's an interesting question. Um, in Congo, we, we listen to music a lot. So I think that is a very important myself as a, as a writer. 
music from the 50s in Congo, which is, um, I think, one of the best literature we have produced so far. Uh, so it's very interesting to see how they, at that time, in the 50, from the 50s to the 70s, they create a lot of uh, the issues that are really relevant today, like the, the, the role of the woman, the, the exchange with, with, the, with Europe and things like that. So another, another um, so uh, as well as we are part of many, uh, so it's very important for us to see how we can connect inside the continent in Africa with other people and other thinkers, uh, but also have allies in uh, Europe, and in countries like Belgium or Switzerland. WASA is part of a network named Arts Collaboratory, which is very important for us because it brings us not only all the practitioners, but also uh, people who are working in their own context to articulate uh, an alternative way to get into the contemporary arts uh, from Colombia or from Palestine. Um, and uh, so it's very, it's an important Thing for us. Another family that we are part of, it's a, it's a group of art educators and another roadmap for art education. And um, it's individuals and working groups all over the world, but with a very strong Africa cluster uh, that is both in uh, Johannesburg, Maseru, uh, in Rwanda, in Uganda, Cairo, and now in Lagos. Um, so it's um, Yes, it's very interesting to see how very different people, like artists, art educators, teachers from the university or from schools, can think together how uh, the transmission and the thinking around art and art education, and that the history of art education, but also art history, can be um, can be shaped in a way because the the normal narrative, the dominant narrative, is excluding. Um, more or less systematically some very important space for criticality and for emancipation. Um, yeah, so that's briefly, to, be, to just be brief, that's a presentation of a kind of networks and thoughts that we are navigating in and trying to break the barrier be between what, like the definition of contemporary art uh, from the early 2000s in Lubumbashi was what can please Europe, <laughs> more or less. And so with that definition, there was this idea who is contemporary, who is not contemporary. And there's a, a joke in Kinshasa who said that if you have never been digging into the, the dash bin, you are not contemporary enough. Uh, and uh, just to break that, it's from that provocation to understand that for us, excluding music, Excluding like urban music from the contemporary arts is, or excluding some of the popular things, and the definition of contemporary art on itself become very, very um, a place of a place of exclusion on itself. So that's the reason why Waza tried to create ally alliances that challenge it and kind of, uh, try to plot alternative to 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 the experimental dominant experimental canons. Voila. Perfect. Thank you, Patrick. Um, Anthea, what how do you see your how do you situate yourself and who are your companions? Um, <clears throat> it's a very interesting question. Um, I so I work as a curator and a writer and I've recently started an online um, primarily online or at least a spaceless platform called Forms, um, which is, is sort of a gallery, I guess, that um, is experimenting with the form of the gallery. But um, my life, my day to day is spent largely behind the laptop, um, I guess, like most other people's lives these days. Um, and I find, you know, I find that my work is very solitary, especially when I'm writing. So 
Um, I, I kind of um, have a writing, I wouldn't so much call it as a practice, as a job, um, that, that's kind of ticking over all the, t all the while while I'm kind of exploring more experimental curatorial projects. And I find that that's a very solitary activity. But at the same time, there, you know, there are these constellations of people and of ideas that are kind of integral to, to everything that I do. I'd say my, maybe my companions um, in a curatorial context are and always have been primarily artists. Um, I feel that I learn more from artists than I do from anyone else. And they're, they're essential to, to kind of how I um, think and work. Um, and then I have almost like the, the voice, you know, in the back of my head or my, my kind of inner voice is informed by, by reading that I do and by particularly by, and this is very unfashionable, but um, French post-structuralist theory, which is something I immersed myself in maybe like more than 10 years ago now, 15 years ago. And, um, and still is very much, I find part of my method, um, you know, is very kind of, I guess, deconstructed. Um, and I find it, um, you know, this is just something that I'm into in maybe like a, a geeky kind of way. And, um, but I feel that my companions are Hélène Sissou, Jacques Derrida, and a bunch of artists who, um, who are scattered all over the world um, and who I'm in contact with primarily by email. So it's not a very, um, I guess it's not a very embodied community and I perhaps wish that it was more embodied, but, um, but yeah. Thank you. Um, Timmy, do you also want to kind of just ev let everyone know where you're situated and uh, who your companions are? Uh, hey, hi everyone again. Right now I'm situated in the dark outside in Cinder College and I'm hearing sounds, so it's a little scary. But um, I am a recent graduate at the Vic University, a fine artist. Uh, I hope you guys can hear me because we speculating. Uh, okay, yeah. Um, I'm a fine artist, primarily a painter. Um, I'm a writer, a zine maker, um, a practitioner. Um, who are my companions? Abangan Bami. Yo, I have so many friends now all of a sudden. Um, but firstly and fundamentally, my, my, my friends are my parents um, because I feel like that's where everything starts. <laughs> and they are the ones that can tell me who's the right friend and who isn't. Um, institutionally, my friends are the JAG, Vanza, um, Sunda Community College. Um, now I have theater friends, drama friends, musicians, uh, but please don't tell them, yeah, I prefer fine artists. <laughs> uh, mm, yeah, I think, yeah, but yeah, I'm just gonna end it there, mm, keep them short. Thank you. I mean, I think that um, a lot of what you've all mentioned sort of ties into my next question, which is, about um, collaboration. And I think that, I mean, in my experience at least, collaboration can seem as challenging as it is promising. Um, but it's very exciting to hear that all of you have some kind of like interest in, yeah, like a, sort of like a cross or interdisciplinary uh, practice, or at least having, you know, con connections um, outside of the quote unquote, you know, art world. Um, so could you, Please just reflect on a moment of collaborative synergy um, and what were the aspects or conditions that, that facilitated um, a successful collaboration? Um, so for instance, um, Jimmy, I don't know if you want to speak maybe about Invade or yeah, any kind of uh, 
any kind of instance that, that comes to mind. <clears throat> uh, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, that's actually funny because I just got a text from an invader who asked me, you're not gonna mention invade. So um, I'm part of a collaboration a collective <laughs> called Invade um, for black women, young black women. Um, started off as eight, and then it went down to seven, and then it went down to six, yeah, but now it's four. Um, however, Invade is not the only collective or collaborative um, thing that I'm doing but recent or currently. Um, I've been working with the Chilai Bolai crew, uh, documenting, archiving, um, and even, yeah, yeah. So through those, through the documentation of, of, the, of the play, sorry guys, I'm a bit distracted. Um, we've had con like conversations about collaborating and starting up other things and um, programs. Another thing, another collective, another collaboration um, that I was a part of recently is Wound Manifesto. Balala um, Rona um, is also one of the things that I'm kind of um, interested in right now. But it's challenging. I think one thing that's challenging about collective for me right now is that I tend to get swallowed by by these collectives, um, I lose myself a lot and I lose um, my own track too. Yeah. yeah. Can you just hold it there a little bit because I need to speak to the people around me. Um, Malemo, do you have any any sort of like anecdotes about, you know, when, when uh, um, a collaboration really worked and what do you think sort of made it made it work so well? Mm. I mean, I when you asked the question, I the word synergy stuck out for me quite a lot. And I think um, of course there are certain sort of collaborative points where synergy is um, really vital and very important, but I also collaborate in ways that are very, I don't know what the opposite of synergy is. <laughs> yeah that I don't have are not where synergy is not the primary kind of connection I think um and and I think that synergy may not always be the thing that that one necessarily looks for in the collaborative process um but obviously I have a lot of synergy with my primary collaborator Nari Mkoto who um we've now been collaborating since our fourth year in university so 12 years ago um and we've met most of those days um since then, um, we meet every every Thursday evening. We're meeting after this discussion, um, and of course, after that amount of time, there's a lot of um, shorthand, a lot of kind of um, assumption that can be made, a lot of kind of um, underlying understanding, which makes things move much more smoothly. Um, you can kind of you don't even necessarily explain everything, and things kind of just flow. Very strong, and that's a kind of much more recent collaboration, maybe just the last four or five years, but also very, very much based on synergy and then the kind of ability and understanding, which sometimes you get with someone even not after a very long time, um, and does definitely enable um, a kind of slickness of process and movement. Um, and um, imagination, and opening up of ideas. Um, but I also work with other larger groups, um, a bunch of neighbors at the moment where there's often a lot of misunderstanding and a lot of kind of, you think we're on the same page and then it uh, turns not. Um, Patrick and I are part of a conversation kind of going around in circles of like uh, very good relationships, but we don't always understand each other um, and tend to have to sort of double back a little bit and try and remember where we stand, etc. Um, and I think that there's a, I've learned immensely from those kinds of collaborative spaces as well, where um, perhaps there's a lot more of balancing of multiple kinds of voices and positions and needs 
um, and a lot more space for losing each other. Um, and I think those those kinds of collaborations give you very different things, um, but also have quite different agendas, I suppose. Thank you. I mean, I think when I when I say synergy, I don't like necessarily mean like a singular voice or coming from like one approach, but I don't know, just almost like that moment where things, there's like maybe been tension or things haven't been working out, or you've been like, you've lost each other. And then that moment of finding each other again and being like, okay, this makes sense. This was worth it. Um, yeah, so Patrick, do you have any, any experiences of that that you would like to share? Uh, yes, I think it's, um, it's a lot of different experiences, so uh, it's very hard to peek into that old basket um, because I think almost every single project we do has a collaborative aspect. Um, and um, yes, some very locally with like young artist collectives in the Bumbashi, some more bilateral, some almost from every, uh, from many continents. It's very different, different uh, projects. Um, so to, to one, yes, I, I can, I can, um, so we, we were invited two, three years ago to do an exhibition in uh, River in uh, Belgium. That was um, uh, an invitation. So it, the invitation was under the assumption that we could be, uh, we could place uh, Bruges as a city, as in uh, in the discourse about African contemporary art. That was not clearly articulated, but that was uh, the expectation, I think. And behind that, there was this challenge that uh, the Bruges Triennale wants as well to expand itself to become more open to new art worlds like uh, Congo. Um, what was actually what what we did was to to present uh, an artist that was coming from countryside. In, uh, and that finally couldn't travel because he didn't get his his own time. Um, but an artist we, in in whom we deeply trust, and um, and his work is really about what is now quite fashionable is this discussion about ancestors and things like that. Um, but at that time, like three years ago, before all this debate about restitution, it was not. Um, it, the, the exhibition, I think, was not a big, it was a success in terms of the discussion it opened up, but it was not a success instead in, in terms of putting the, that center in the discourse about what is contemporary African art today. Um, so for me, it was, uh, how can I say? Um, so there's always in that collaboration, the request, the layer under the request and the layer under the layer under the request. And all those layers are very difficult to, to manage, all those ambitions, all those assumptions, all, all those games, um, especially when we come from so different region. And um, operating in a, in, a, in a context where there's one institution with money, one part of the collaboration who has the means for the production, and the other who is supposed to have the content um, create very strange imbalance on who decides on, on the term of the, of the success or not of, of, of such a collaboration. Um, and that's, I think it's a very big um, problem in the contemporary collaborations. Um, because the content doesn't have the same value than the money, in a way. And so the money has to decide on the content and sometimes not easy to make the difference. Um, and there's also the, 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 the game that is played about this question of representativity of 
being the, the African token, the Congolese token, the black token, or whatever. Um, that, of course, it's very easy to say it's a game and you can reverse the weapon to, and to use it as a, as a tool. Um, but you cannot, build, you cannot build a sustainable relation, a sustainable even for your organizations with those kind of games. So there's still the moment when you need to re re rethink yourself and not uh, playing the game that the other wants you to play or playing against that cliches. Um, so one of the collaboration that for me was also part of this, you can call the challenges, was um, my, the invitation I, will, I got a few years ago to uh, to establish an umbrella of biennials that was called the National Biennial Associations, because at that time I was uh, running the Lubumbashi Biennial, and then you you discover in a you you, you put yourself in a room with 100 so-called biennial directors, and you have absolutely nothing in common. They have budget that is at least 1,000 times yours, and means and and you need to create a community. You need to create the community under the assumption that we, we put the same names on the project you do, but beyond the name, there's nothing in common. Um, so it's, it's um, of course, it generates frustration. It generates a uh, feeling of exclusion, it generates fears. Um, but what, what is very interesting from there, it's also a very nice, learning experience because it helps you then to, to, to rename or to rethink your involvement in projects that you are doing. It helps you to, to kind of recenter and come back to, the, I think now after five years, we are now rebuilding the relationship with the, with the art world, which is on very different terms. And that is only possible because there has been those tries and those, dead hands that push us to come back and to, to continue. Uh, and I think collaboration, like uh, collaboration is a, a very, it's like a, a labyrinth that at least when you are back, it's not, it's, it's not a loss of time and energy. It's that you already know that this is not the right direction to go for you. Um, so there's less possibility, but it's still, very difficult to understand where are the good uh, companion that helps you to arrive to the to the end of the the labyrinth, um, knowing that the end of the labyrinth is an opening for a new one, of course, because life is a is a succession of projects. So I have the feeling that there's um, so collaboration always gets to a point when the human parts become more important than the imbalance of means, the imbalance of knowledges and the misunderstanding, because um, that is the level where the, the, the constructions become very relevant and the possibilities start to open up new, new ways of doing and of thinking. Beyond, beyond, I will say, the, the intellectual and beyond the financial. Yeah, I mean, I think that you've touched on a really interesting point around um, the sort of the, the dynamics that are tied um, specifically to funding, um, which is, yeah, I have, I have a question uh, about that, which I'll, I'll get to in a bit. Um, but just to move on to Anthea, have there been, um, and in, in a previous conversation, I remember you saying that you as a curator want to work and be alongside um, the artists that you engage with. And I thought that that was like a very, like a very beautiful sentiment. Um, have you had any sort of like moments of successful collaboration and you know, what, what has informed those? Hmm. I think, I mean, I've had many kind of enriching and fun and, fulfilling co collaborations and I think that um, you know that have been productive and I think done important work and I think um, 
these have all happened when I have, and I'm not saying that I'm the reason that they worked, but I think what's important in a collaboration is to kind of know your position or know your place, um, particularly as a curator. Um, and I think that place is as an enabler for artistic practice. And so, I mean, that's how I, I always try to, that's how I see myself and that's how I try to behave as a kind of enabler of artistic practice. Um, so an example, I guess, of when this worked really well, um, I could maybe talk about a project called, um, it was called a DreamWorks Art Fair, which um, no longer seems to exist online, but this was a project um, a performance-based project by two artists um, named Simon Asensio and Adriano Wilfred Jensen. And um, they made a, um, they had an idea for an art fair that could only be experienced while you're sleeping through your dreams. So it was a kind of speculative fiction that was then performed um, as a, a series of interventions that involved everybody kind of getting together and sleeping and um, it, it was a really kind of out there project which involved sleeping and pretending to visit an art fair um, that didn't really exist and um, it's um, it, it, it was just so completely left field that it almost was kind of doomed not to take off in a way it was just so obscure but what was really rewarding about this was that um was that we we were able to stage it and realize it nonetheless so we had an event at the bergen kunsthal in um, bergen in norway where i had been based for some time and then subsequently moved between joburg and bergen quite a lot and we um so we had an event where sort of several artists came and did dream interventions while the audience um, sort of reclined or slept or and it was a kind of an experiment with hypnosis and performance and um, and the possibility of realizing this was in part because of the openness of Bergen Kunsthal and um, a small amount of funding we received from the municipality of Bergen um, and also just an extreme kind of openness of of the other artists and performers involved and for me this was um what was so important about this process was was me not intervening and saying i think this is too eccentric or i don't think people are going to get it or we need more of a frame of reference or we need to be more relevant um, I resisted these things and I kind of went along with it um, as if we were playing a game. And I think um, to me, that was, that was my place. That was an appropriate way for me to be as a curator. Um, you know, I, I, I made the context possible through creating institutional collaborations and garnering some financial support. And after, after I'd, helped to create that kind of structure. My job was to, you know, step aside and let this crazy idea happen, you know. So, yeah, so I think to sort of summarize that little anecdote, I think the key for me to making a good collaboration is knowing what you're there for, you know, what purpose you serve in the collaboration. Um, and, and I guess also just being open to things unfolding in unpredictable ways. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, so my next question is about, yeah, I mean, so the pandemic has unveiled a lot of underlying systemic social fissures, as well as just, you know, the general precariousness of art, which I think was visible um, even before COVID-19. Um, what are, what is like a, a major issue that you're facing um, in your practice? And then what is a sort of like a larger structural pathology um, in, in the art ecosystem that, that you've identified? I don't know who, who would like to kind of go first on that one. 
Um, I can sort of jump in, I guess. Um, what I've noticed is um, with the shift to things online, the shift to self-representation online, um, you know, that's kind of been necessitated by the shattering of physical spaces and physical mobility. Um, the move online has been good for some and less good for others. And I think what's very evident to me is the ability to access resources to manage your presence online is, um, is hugely determinant in how you fare in this kind of, you know, new primarily digital era for contemporary art. So um, that uh, the resources or the ability to self-represent online comes down to simple things like um, how you're able to, or to what extent you're able to generate content like video material, to what extent you're able to build a attractive website. You know, that's something that's not only functional, but that is kind of up to speed with the aesthetic standards kind of expected in the art world. And, um, and I think that because of the distribution of resources, you know, internationally, um, when you look at kind of African galleries and platforms by comparison with um, platforms in Europe that are perhaps funded by cultural endowments and things like that, you can see that there's a disparity in how institutions are able to self-represent online and artists are able to self-represent online. So I think, you know, it's, it's kind of an obvious, maybe it's an obvious thing to say, but the systemic problem there is obviously um, distribution of resources. So the internet is not as equal as everybody sort of fantasizes that it is. And, and I think, um, yeah, I, I think that that's really evident as you look at, you know, how galleries, particularly um, from from Africa, since we're talking about Africa, we might as well talk about Africa, how they're able to self-represent um, online. Yeah, I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah, it it, it does. I mean, I think um, in many ways, sort of in, a, in our pre-COVID world, we um, the sort of like we overestimated, I think, the capacity um, of of the digital and virtual space also as like a, a as a connective space. Um, I mean, as you say, you know, the internet isn't isn't a super equal space, and I think that increasingly we've seen that more and more. Um, yeah, Malemo, um, do you have an answer to to the question about like something that you're yeah that you are facing in your own in your own practice and then it's sort of like a larger systemic issue. I think um, sort of in relation to what, what Anthea was just saying that um, on the one hand um, there is this kind of inequality and inability to sort of I suppose keep up um, but it's it's for me the thing that's been quite heavy has been the keeping up um, so, so in the beginning of the kind of major lockdowns of last year, one of the things that happened was, there was just this rush to, to get online. Um, and a lot of gallery spaces were immediately sort of, um, I don't know, the fancy ones were getting the Matterport cameras and doing these like really um, fancy scanned shows. And then other people were kind of doing whatever they could to, to get online. Um, and I, I felt this year, kind of a compounding of the need to be hyper-productive um, in order to feel connected somehow. Um, and kind of, I think, connected to what Anthea was saying about um, kind of the need to be visible and th that those who've been able to kind of play the visibility game. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not uh, very good at social media, so I think like uh, personally, it's, it's more about like, um, responding to every email and getting involved in everything that I that I get asked to get involved in um, because it, it creates some kind of connection and linkage. Um, 
which sort of over a year now of like real human um, relationship being just completely missing actually um, and, and not being able to, I think, um, create a sense of the value of one's work through a Zoom screen has been really difficult for me. Um, and there's this, there was a really beautiful example in the early rush of people putting shows up on screen as if it was some kind of replacement for the real thing. Um, there was one gallery, I wanna say in the Netherlands, but somewhere in Europe who took a strategy of instead of putting work up um, on a website or whatever, had this like really old analog strategy where they, um, they said that you could call into the museum and, or you could set an appointment um, and the museum would call you and the person who would talk to you, who could be anybody in the museum, it could be the security guard, the cleaner, some fancy curator, um, would be speaking to you and they would describe the picture to you and they'd describe their own interests in the image and give you a bit of a history of it, but um, much more a kind of personal experience of it, um, which was just such a completely different strategy to this kind of like hyper visibility model. And in some ways really speaks to, I think, um, the substantial challenge that we have of kind of having to play this kind of international economic game of hyper visibility, hyper productivity, hyper presence. Um, when actually a lot of the reason we practice in this field is for very different reasons. Um, and I'm, I'm finding it very difficult actually to um, create the kinds of value of those other reasons of a kind of social connection, kind of working through urgent, um, really important subject matter, finding ways through really important questions, that part of the work. Um, I'm quite recently realizing I'm really struggling uh, for and kind of replacing with something else that isn't working. That, that idea of sort of like calling into the museum and having someone describe it to you sounds, yeah, just I think, I mean, even just like personal, personal touch um, is something that we've really missed in this last year. Um, and what you were saying about keeping up, you know, the keeping up comes at much personal cost. And I think that's also what sort of like the last 12 plus months have, have shown us. Um, it's almost with, I don't know, for me personally, like the WhatsApp tone and the email tone create like a new sense of anxiety than like previously, because it, it seems like the only way you can really speak to people. Um, yeah, and I know specifically also in your practice, that, that sense of urgency and sense of like, you know, tangible, on the ground, like, like real, real life things. Yeah, it must be extremely difficult to navigate that. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if MTV and Patrick are still with us. I'm not seeing their names on, on the screen. Patrick is very present. Okay. I'm <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, is there, is there something like a particular challenge um, that, that you've been experiencing in your practice? but also kind of like ties to, to a larger systemic issue? Um, yes, I think I, I agree with uh, both Molimo and Antti about the, the fact that saying that something is on internet doesn't make that it's accessible to everyone. Um, and uh, this problem of the pandemic was that uh, the cost of the, the video download or consultation is very high in Congo. Um, so you need a, a budget that many artists and uh, arts practitioners uh, don't have for having access to a virtual exhibition or to all those videos, the trans iteration of uh, museum visits. Um, then the other the other thing is like online. It's also um, not uh, easy for everyone, like even for us, I would say, but for myself. Um, so the 
we have been we have been as well as have been very uh, a kind of interface between physical presence of the artists we could gather on into the space and uh, kind of international dialogue that we could start with uh, our networks both into Congo in Africa or elsewhere. Um, and Waza was closed for many months, so it's raised the question of um, what the space could become and of course because of many different reasons not necessarily related to pandemic but becoming um, more drastic because of the pandemic questioning about questions about will we continue paying that rent for this venue in the city center became very uh, important um, and to rethink, to rethink the space because you cannot gather 200 persons uh, I think it became very interesting for us it's 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 a big challenge and the answer we found was first to say okay let's do virtual guided tour we have a, a YouTube channel but that it's it will not happen appear there and uh, we can find different with the, with the community around us and the best format we found it's still not uh, the most cost efficient but it, at least less expensive is a uh, is a sound so we opened up a, a, a web radio that was launched a few days just before i came here like sound instead of images but also because it also helped to to close the eyes I think it's very diff, diff, um, uh, we, oh, we we have a lot of invitation to look with these things like look here, look there, look there, and it's very sometimes very important with the context of the pandemic to ask people to close their eyes and to give space to their own imagination about all all that is happening now. Um, and so, the, is there a pathology in the art world? I think. All the pathologies of the artworks was revealed during this crisis because we saw, okay, how in the adaptation that everyone had to undertake, we we find all the all the strengths and all the problems becoming bigger. Like, will uh, like the visa issues, like how how it is now and how. This nationalistic national nationalist opinion about borders that of course it's the contrary of what the pandemic is teaching us and it's just the answer is always into the paradigm of what we already know so we close the borders uh, we don't talk to each other um, I think I think it's outside the pathology that the society has. And uh, it's not necessarily the pathology that are proper to the art world. Um, but what, what, it was, what was reduced, uh, the same way that the people has this kind of feeling that the, the nature, the earth was breathing, I have the feeling that also this um, kind of extractivism uh, of content was also arrive at a breathing point. Um, so I think the fact that people are, has to look around themselves, give space for reconnection, I hope we will see that will become, um, uh, give space to those trans, trans, translocal connections that are on relevance on, on, on humanity and not on calculation about what can I take from from going there or for discussing with that person first? I think there's oh oh there's some sounds coming from some oh. microphone. Sorry, sorry. Ah, okay. Yeah, so in brief, that's my 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 opinion about the pandemic. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Um, so I think I just have two more questions and I think, yeah, and then we can move, move swiftly on to our Q&A. Um, so this 
kind of connects to uh, what Patrick was saying earlier about the sort of the dynamics and the sort of power plays involved in funding. Um, yeah, so the kind of terms and conditions of funding um, often include a host of different agendas. Some are more easy to navigate than others. Um, I think we also seem to have an overdependence on foreign cultural agencies um, to fund projects. Um, can any of you imagine a different type of funding system or a different solution to this? I, I can go. <laughs> um, the, it's it's a, it's it's a, it's an easy it's an easy um, game. It's an easy say to to blame the foreign agency for taking control of the of the arts on our context. And um, and the. The, if without thinking a lot, we will say that the alternative is that our country invests enough in, into the art. Like in Congo, we we are fighting for having a cultural policy and thinking that the state will put a lot of money into that. Um, but if you look back, if we look back, we have moments like at, at least for visual arts, we had a, a moment where when the state was putting money into that. And we cannot think that as, as uh, that period as a model. When Mobutu was a president here, he put a lot of money to develop what was called Mobutu modernism. And um, at that moment, there has been a, a generation of artists close to the fine arts school, the Académie des Beaux Arts in Kinshasa, who became very important and have exchanged with Japan. They went to Cuba for the for the launch of the Habana Biennial and so on. It was, yes, it was good in a way, but uh, when we look at the legacy of that generation in terms of addressing particular issues that we were facing, and especially the dictatorship, especially the fact that a very small amount of people was putting in their pocket the complete, the resource for the whole country and leaving people in this, the state that we know Congo today. And seeing the artists just for drinking champagne and enjoying themselves and actually not even developing a, a school that we can build on now. And we are now obliged to have these small art centers all over the country to develop it. That is not what we want. So, um, so of course we can we can blame everyone. We can blame the state. We can blame the embassies. Um, but I think the responsibility for for us is to, like we say in the visual arts, we need to to look what is happening in other fields. How are the music industry operating? I think it's definitely not something that we can copy. But they, they don't have the same complaint that we have. Uh, because they are able to develop uh, a constituency of people aware of what they do, and they are, they are able to mobilize uh, um, the whole society to think with them about what they are doing. And for, for, for the moment, we are not yet at that level of mobilization, uh, because I think as well that we, we see ourselves as isolated and in a way, we are building our own elitism. Um, I think it's very important. The, the economy is also a question of relevance in the society and um, how, how artists, how curators I see the role as citizen is linked to how they can develop inside that very society, the means for them to, to operate. Um, it can seem quite, um, how can I say, angelic, romanticizing. But um, when we speak about sponsorship, we speak about um, social responsibility of, of uh, companies, when you speak about um, like part of the money that goes to the community, I think, yes, there's money for 
developing the country and there's many and we we need to be strong enough to say that we are part of that creation of imagination that is developing the country and for that we need to speak not only with the state but we need to speak with the with the with the private sectors we need to speak with the, all of those different sectors sorry Thank you, Patrick. Yeah, I really like what you said about kind of like borrowing strategies from different industries. And I do think that, yeah, we just need to be thinking like much more dynamically. Um, and I think also as very creative people who are like used to solving all kinds of problems, sometimes we don't necessarily like apply the same creativity or the same kind of like the same imagination to, to different kinds of issues. Um, yeah. Does anybody else have have a kind of like a suggestion or an imagining funding could, could operate differently? Hey. <laughs> hey, so oh my god, I'm going through the most. Um I think what's important about yeah, I'm gonna go into the dark again. What's important about um, collaborations and collaborative communities is that I can run out of data and I know that I can run across the auditorium and go find someone that can, you know, data me, you know, hotspot me. Um, I think alternative ways of funding really come from understanding and looking at people's backgrounds and really understanding the intricate stuff that goes on, you know, um, that the show goes on, you know, things in like life really still happens. Um, you'll be in the middle of the web a webinar and your data will finish, you know, um, or your battery will run out or there's load shedding. Um, and, you, you know, it, it goes back to that question that I wanted to answer or respond to about the challenges um, that you face with basically <laughs> representing yourself. Um, resources, obviously data, obvious, all that stuff, but then you can have access to all those things, but still not have, um, your content is not clean enough, I guess, um, not palatable. So you still have to go and buy paint, ah, you know? So it's just a circle of a whole lot of, excuse my language, shit that happens um, in the background. Um, that's real. Uh, and I think it goes back to really being and not being pretentious and ideologizing, kind of things, something. Being ideological, hey, you see, um, about stuff and always just talking, 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 and and making it look pretty with words and and not interacting on a human level. Um, I think that's where the solutions come in, where you know. Kimi doesn't have to ask for a guys go guying data. You know, it's a it's a known thing. Um, I'm not saying that Mpimi needed data, I know, but yeah. Um, so alternative ways of funding come from alternative ways of communicating and being together um, and understanding each other beyond this COVID excuse um, thing that's been put, you know, between us. Um, <laughs> friendships. Um, okay, yeah, I think I'll, I'm done. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Think if, yeah, if, if maybe I can sort of riff off what Mpumit has sort of brought to the conversation. Um, I mean, I think what I find very useful about what you're saying is, is, is effectively there's there've always been multiple ways of practicing practicing um, in this way and of, of, of being in, in an artist or in the arts. 
Um, and whether it was kind of the Medicis or an Oba of the Bidi kingdom, there has always been the kind of statist, um, high-end sort of patronage of very particular kinds of art. Um, but there've always been other ways of operating in creative practice that perhaps didn't fit into that sort of image. And I think a lot of, um, a lot of what we think of when we think of funding is that kind of, um, kind of high power patronage style of funding. And when we get upset with the National Arts Council in South Africa, or as Patrick says, sort of expect our governments to fund the arts, um, that, is, that is and has always been one model of support for the arts. And I think we get quite caught up in, um, in that model being the model. Um, and, and I think what Mpumitsa points to is the ways in which people have um, found ways to practice and to explore their, their kind of forms of creative expression um, in other modalities. And, and I'm, I'm personally less interested in um, sort of trying to chase down the, the South African national government's kind of funding of the arts or trying to say that they should be funding the arts more than Europeans are funding the arts. Um, I'm, I'm not sure how helpful that conversation is. I think um, what both Patrick and Umpimita point to is, is kind of the fact that, um, that financing has always been of a certain kind of value, um, but there's other forms of value and relevance that have been financed in other ways. And, and a sort of collaborative practice might be one of them, um, but self-financing is another. Um, and I think there's a lot more space for kind of exploring multiple, multiple strategies of financing and, and being able to kind of link into um, the parts that make sense at the, at the right moment. Um, but this idea that the solution is to kind of have less European funding and more African funding, I think is quite sort of short on imagination. Thanks, Malevo. Um, Anthea, do you have any any idea or any um, anything to add to this? Well, um, I think um, I think that it's artists have always had an ambivalent relationship with money, in that when you are creating something completely new or trying to or creating something that upsets the order of things, um, the contexts for the monetization of that activity don't necessarily exist. So um, that's not to say that, that everything we do or that we strive to do is completely new, but, but I think that artistic practice is, is at some point always disruptive and and there are very there's very little economic infrastructure for for what is disruptive so um you know i i think that mm, i mean I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that we should just give up all hope of looking for funding but but i i think that the reason it's so difficult is because because we're creating contexts and we're creating new contexts and new terms of reference um, where they possibly don't exist before. Um, one thing which I am quite hopeful about, I guess, is if um, is the possibility of a model of collecting or patronage changing so that um, you know, people realize that they are, they don't only have to buy or buying work for your collection is not the only way to sort of experience and enjoy um, accessing art. And people, you know, philanthropists with billions of dollars and everything are sort of in a position to fund institutions and activities, but a lot of people with a lot less money than that who still have a lot more money than artists are also in a position to find activities that are not necessarily going to result in giving them artworks to add to their collections. So the reason I raise this is because I, you know, it's 
it's a way of relating to the art world that I personally enjoy. So whenever I see a bit of money, I, you know, I put it into an art project or, um, or, you know, sometimes buy an artwork, but, um, but using money that I have access to, to enable artistic practice is a very fulfilling kind of way for me to spend money. Not that I have a lot of it, but as I said, when I do see it, I spend it on art. And I can only imagine that people with access to more capital would enjoy the same sort of approach to patronizing the arts. And um, I, the problem is I don't know how to get from A to B. So I don't know how to get people to spend their money in that way you know and if I, I think the trick is that if we did know then then that would be the problem solved you know I think there'd be a lot more people kind of micro patrons if you can call in that um, so I don't know maybe one day I'll figure it out but I think this yeah this idea of a kind of micro patron is something that's 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 quite interesting to me I guess you get it with things like backer buddy and um, crowdfunding campaigns of sort of build on this idea of the kind of micro patron but um but I feel that there's a lot there's a lot of wealth that's untapped in the sort of um pre-millionaire kind of bracket you know where there are people who still have a lot of access to capital but don't necessarily see themselves as the super rich but are still in a position I think to direct some of that capital to um to kind of self-organizing art world um so yeah if i figure it out i'll um i'll let you know thanks Anthea. yeah i think that's that's a really um interesting interesting idea so i just have one more question um and then i think we'll maybe open it up to the floor for a very quick q a because i know people have places to be and things to do um but my last question is just really around um, yeah, thinking through ideas of care and reciprocity. Um, do you have channels, established channels through which you can like share your knowledge and skill? Um, so thinking about, you know, how we, how we, uh, yeah, how we create contexts of like, um, of reciprocity um, and yeah, if anybody has a, has a response to that. Hmm. Just because I like the sound of my own voice, um, I'm gonna <laughs> chime in here. Um, I feel like I've gained so much uh, and that I've been given so much in terms of mentorship and um, access to knowledge, you know, from, from people all over the art world in South Africa and abroad. And I, um, so I'm very grateful for that and I fully acknowledge that my um, whatever successes I have are because of that largely but what I find that I lack is the is opportunities to um, to reciprocate so I wish that I had more opportunities to reciprocate and more channels to reciprocate I find that there are ad hoc moments where um, you know, like this, where I'm kind of invited to be on a panel. I'm not saying that I want more panel um, opportunities, but I, I feel that there are there are things that I can contribute, particularly to kind of younger curators and artists. Um, and there, but I just don't know what to do or who to talk to or what the channels are or if my experience and knowledge and contacts are even desirable so I mean this is maybe not quite answering your question in a productive way but you know if if anyone uh, knows of any channels then um, I'm very curious um, I, I think it's important and I don't think that enough of these channels exist because I know that there are a lot of people who are hungry for knowledge hungry for no opportunities and access and there are people who have knowledge and opportunities and access um, but I feel like the networks between the two are on often not coherent, you know, or 
we don't know the way from one side to the other side, or at least I don't really know the way from one side to the other side. Yeah, I think that we don't have um, a lot of sort of like formal channel channels, especially around mentorship, which, as you say, is like such a crucial component to one's sort of uh, personal and professional development. Um, and I think, I mean, in my experience, it's just been sort of like a lot of just like having coffees with people and just like the, the richness and beauty that, that comes out of those conversations, it's like so incredibly valuable. Um, but I'm sure that if you're open, if you're open to that, and you know, now everyone who's part of this, who's tuned in knows that, um, you might get some, some emails. Um, does anybody else? Uh, want to respond to yeah just like ways in which that they're um, engaging with the and when I say reciprocity I don't necessarily mean like a, a similar exchange to the same person but maybe kind of like passing on that acquired knowledge to someone to someone else um, in the process. Um, so Patrick unmuted his mic, so I thought he was still oh, okay. going <laughs> go next, but if he's still thinking. Uh, okay. No, just very, very quickly, I, uh, I think there's a way to, to, to give care with no, no money, but the only thing that you always need is time. So <laughs> I think you need, you need to allocate time for it. If, if, you, if you fill your time with work and uh, very qualified things, so you have no space for it. So for me, the, the, it's very important to know that you, you you give it time at least. If you don't, even if you don't have the means, but you have, you can organize your time to to be available for for that. Mm. Um. I, I, personally, um, I, I tend to be quite uncomfortable with sort of ideas of things like mentorship. Um, I've had a few people ask me to be their mentor and I, I find it quite hard, um, but always very willing to have a coffee. <laughs> um, but I think that there's also, I'm, I'm going to do a bit of a shameless plug here, but um, <laughs> I, slightly shame plug, um, that there's, there's there's always kind of um, multiplicities of needs of care um, that, uh, you know, there's the kind of professional mentoring sort of thing, but there's, there's sort of many other spaces. And so my, my selfish plug is for um, a recent project called Take Care, um, being run by Vansa. Um, and I'll put the website in the comments, if anybody's interested. But it's um, a project that's trying to think about particularly mental health in um, the visual arts sector um, and is kind of prompted by um, the, the what's, what feels like the other pandemic um, in, in our sector um, and personal experiences of um, failing and kind of uh, flailing in trying to get to, to be able to care based on the kind of limited knowledge and, and capacity. Um, and so the project tries to kind of open up the conversation to some degree, but also give, give sort of um, quite practical tips and resources and skills um, for all of us to be able to take care of each other a little bit better. Um, and I think that kind of um, maybe more sort of emotional um and personal part of care that goes sort of beyond the professional side um is actually something that i have not actually been that good at um um in within the kind of visual art space um I've, I've always been better at the more professional thing um but does feel like something that we all need to be taking much more cognizance of and perhaps the the, the pandemic's kind of made that more real um so yeah Shameless plug for Vansatech.care. <laughs> Thanks, Alemo. Um, Pimi, are you still here? No, okay. Um, I think then, uh, do we have any Q and A's? Um, yeah, do we have any questions from, from the audience? 
Um, no one's put anything into the Q&A box or into the chat. Um, maybe audience members, now's your, now's your opportunity um, if anybody wants to say anything. Deafening silence. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, well, um, in that case, just a huge thank you to all of the panelists um, for being so willing also to just share, share your knowledge and wisdom. Um, I've really enjoyed this conversation and I hope that it's, it's been enjoyable for the audience as well. So thank you so much. And thank you to Sarah and uh, the Next Foundation. Mm -hmm. Thank you, panelists. Thank you. thank you so much to our audience members as well. I appreciate you signing in and listening. Um, as I mentioned, there is a last panel discussion next week. Um, and we're hoping that this project, um, well, I'm, I know this project will reveal itself in a series of, of um, essays of which Gemma is, is writing one along with all of our um, other moderators of our other panel discussions. There will also be a physical exhibition um, and a zine which will come out. So if you guys are interested in those things and seeing kind of how all the 20 odd participants who have participated in this program, um, what they ultimately come out with, just keep your eyes on our Facebook and Instagram pages and we'll let you know when everything's published and online and ready and when the exhibition's taking place. And of course, we would love to see you there, whether that is physically or if you are just, um, Kind of attending virtually as we know we live in very strange times at the moment um there is a question oh i'm sorry from quasi quasi's asking how does everyone deal with zoom fatigue mm -hmm. <laughs> it's exhausting <laughs> i don't have an answer <laughs> um i do find myself personally i spend a lot of time in zoom meetings and it does mean that I actually want to socialize less. So when I do get to see human beings, I'm kind of a little bit more protective because I find they're more exhausting than meeting people in regular social circumstances. And I'm not quite sure why it's more exhausting. Um, does anyone else want to answer? No. Going to bed. Just going to bed. <laughs> <Go ahead. laughs> Okay, well, with that, and unless there are any other questions, last minute questions from anyone, I think we're going to uh, wrap up. And again, thank you to everyone who has participated. We appreciate your time and your effort and your words of wisdom. Um, so thank you for helping us in this debate. I hope you have a good evening. Thank you. Keep warm and safe. Mm. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gemma. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye, guys. Thanks, Robert.